you seated, and welcome to Cornerstone Church, where our mission is to be a loving family of faith who joyfully responds to God's grace in the power of the Holy Spirit. And if you're a guest here today, we're especially glad that you're here. You might notice we have a lot of guests today, excited. We, um, we're going to welcome the Girl Scouts troop uh, to church today. They are going to um, use our building to do their Girl Scout things, and so we're going to uh, welcome them and pray for them today, and just excited that you all are, are part of our service today and, and part of the life of our church, part of our family of faith. So thank you. Thank you for being here. Um, if you're a guest here and you have a prayer request or you want to know more about, more about what's going on in the life of our church, uh, I really appreciate you filling out a contact card. They should be in front of you in the back of the, the pew in front of you. And uh, if I have your email, I can send you information about what's happening in the life of the church or if you just have something you want me to pray for, it's always my honor to pray for you um, or any other contact information or you'd like to share, that would be, that'd be well appreciated. So thank you for that. Um, we started a new uh, cross-training class today. Um, we're going through, for the adults, we're going through uh, Matthew chapter 26 and 27. And I kind of set it up like um, we do our men's Bible study on Wednesday mornings, just kind of pose some questions about the text and then create a conversation. And I think we had a really nice study today. We, we only got through about a quarter of the, the information, but that was, that was good. We had some good, good insight on the text and who Jesus is and um, what he does for us as our Savior as the Passover lamb who, um, who saves us. Um, so we're going to be working our way through Matthew 26 and 27 as we approach Easter. We're kind of in the, in the Lenten season, and we're going to look at these texts that will be read in the Tenebrae service on Mon Monday, Thursday, right before the Easter uh, service. So it would be a good way for us to prepare our hearts for uh, the celebration of the resurrection, and, which is coming very soon. So... Um, and of course, the, the children and youth also have a wonderful cross-training classes, so hope you all will join us at 9.15 in the coming weeks to be a part of that. Uh, the men's Bible study is still going strong. Wednesday mornings, we're in Luke, I think we're still in five, if I forget if we're in the end of five or six yet, but I'll figure that out before Wednesday, so look forward to that. Um, Pastor DJ and his family are out of town today, so I'm, I'm flying solo, but they'll be back soon, and we will have PYM Squared on, uh, on Wednesday evening this coming week, so um, if your youth are inclined to come. That'd be terrific. We always have a great time. Uh, the last couple weeks really have been meaningful. We've really um, reflected on what it means to, uh, to love Christ and to love each other as brothers and sisters in the faith and had a lot of fun too doing it. DJ is doing a terrific job leading, leading our youth ministry and, and Ruthie as well. Uh, the ladies Bible study, do you have one week left? This is the last one this coming Wednesday. So the ladies meet here in the sanctuary at 630 and so you can Catch the end of that if you haven't been a part of it. I know that uh, Priscilla Shire does a great job, and Elijah is such a powerful prophet. It's definitely a good, good study to be part of. And then tonight, we are doing, I saw it flash up there a minute ago, um, we're having our book study tonight on I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist. And it's a great book. Um, I've really enjoyed working my way through it. And just the premise of it is everyone has a worldview. Everyone has a belief. We've all put our faith in something. And it's most logical to put our faith in God who's revealed himself in Jesus Christ. It takes a lot more faith to not believe in God, to be an atheist, th than it does to believe in the creator of the universe who's revealed himself in the person of Jesus. So I um, hope you all be a part of that tonight at 6.30. We've had some good conversations and learned a lot. Um, I typed up some discussion questions to kind of help, help us along and um, hope to see you there. And so... Um, before we read the psalm, I want to in invite the Girl Scout troop leaders and the Girl Scouts to come up for a minute. And I saw a microphone over here a minute ago. Did it disappear? I didn't. You got a way back there? Come on over here, ladies. So um, let me grab the microphone. I'm going to. They didn't know they were going to be interrogated, so I'm going to ask some questions. Is it on? Can you turn on mic two up there, fellas? The same one Kip's been using? And I'll give this to Penelope. You're the winner of the, of the talking stick there. So um, I'm not sure. If on the not. bottom of the mic, there's a white button. You push it in, it turns it on. Oh, we've got to know the technical aspects of this. It'll turn green, and there's this little switch. That turn it to green. There we go. All right, awesome. So in Girl Scouts, you have to be on your toes. You have to learn how to do things impromptu, I guess, right? So um, how many, so this is, this is Penelope Taylor. She and um, her daughters, Allison and Elizabeth, have been worshiping with us for a couple months now. And we you, sit over there. What's that? We usually sit over there. What? We usually sit over there. 
oh yeah, they sit over there, yeah. I was like, I know where everyone sits because I'm out there looking and talking. Um, and their oldest daughter, um, Taylor, not Taylor, T Tiffany, uh, Tiffany Taylor, um, recently um, in, went into the Army, Air Force. Air Force. Air Force. <laughs> I should have prepared a little better for this, right? But we prayed for her a couple months ago and uh, hear that she's doing well. She just finished basic training, right? Yeah, now she's in Biloxi, Mississippi for schooling. So, um, yeah, she's in Biloxi, Mississippi now. So, yeah, she finished basic and she's in Biloxi. Awesome. Well, we'll keep praying for her. And um, this is Julie Sly on the end. And she's also a troop leader. So she's another, oh, she's trying to get rid of the mic now. So, okay, so now Julie's got the mic. We'll ask you a few questions. No. So <laughs> how long has this troop been, been functioning? How long have you all been together? How old are you? Let's see. So about 16, 15, 16 years. Wow. 15 months. And have you all been the troop leaders for that long? We've been a part of it. Um, I'd say we've been troop leaders by ourselves for probably about seven, 10 years. Uh -huh. so, uh, and what, what, do you, what kind of things do you think uh, are instilled in these young ladies' lives through the, through the Scouts? Well, I can jump to. Do that, or would y'all like to do um, your pledge? I think if you hear the Girl Scout pledge, it, it kind of uh, gives a little insight into what we believe in. Uh, we are a God-fearing troop, uh, so why don't we do that? I see lips moving. They're trying to remember how the pledge goes. So. <laughs> That's awesome. And so we're uh, <laughs> we're very excited to be um, hopefully a part of your church. Um, Penelope has told us that you uh, do some missions within the community uh, that we would love to be a part of. Um, we would like to embrace the church if you will embrace us and um, help the church out in any way in any of your missions that you are interested in. Um, we have some very sweet girls, uh, hardworking girls. We just wrapped up our cookie selling season, so uh, we're very happy now. <laughs> so, uh, uh, yeah. so um, it's just an honor to be here. Um, we have been uh, through a few churches. Uh, uh, we were at Garris Chapel and Seven Springs Baptist Church, and the Lord has led us here. So we, we look forward to see um, what unfolds. Well, we're super excited and honored that you're here. Um, it's always been our intent when we started Cornerstone Church uh, to use our building um, throughout the week and to, to build relationships with people in the community, uh, to partner with people as we seek to serve God together. And uh, we thank you that, that, that you all provide an opportunity for us to do that. We're excited to get to know you all better. And we know that uh, there'll be chances with PYM Squared, our youth group, to do some things collaboratively. And so that's, that's fantastic. So welcome to our church. And um, let, me, let me pray for you all. Brian, yeah, go ahead, Dan. Uh, we normally meet on Mondays every other week, and we want to start doing some more camping, so if anybody wants to be a part of that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so uh, every other Monday, and we usually meet 6 to 7.30. That's awesome. And we have a few more girls uh, that could not make it today. Uh, how, many, how many girls are in your troop altogether? Uh, well, we've, we've had a few come and go, so we have about 12 now. Mm -hmm. That's terrific. Well, let's pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for the, the Girl Scouts that are here today and others that are part of this troop, and we just ask your blessings to be upon them, Lord. Um, help them to uh, just have a wonderful year, to encourage each other, to love one another, uh, to seek to keep their pledge, to, to honor you and the ministries they are part of and their life together. Uh, we thank you, Lord, that you've called them to be uh, part of Cornerstone Church here, and just we can share life together and, and uh, seek to, to serve you well. Um, we, we thank you for their presence here today, and we just pray that our worship would be pleasing in your sight. Uh, we love you, and we thank you for all that you're doing for us and, and all the ways that you're with us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, thank you. God bless you all. <laughs> we, we'll, let, we'll let Kit figure out what to do with it next. So she's, yeah. Well, let's continue our service as we worship the Lord reading 
portions of Psalm 18. So listen now to the Holy Word of God. The psalmist says, I love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. My God, my rock, in whom I take refuge. My shield and the horn of my salvation. My stronghold. He made darkness his covering around him, his canopy thick clouds dark with water. Out of the brightness before him there broke through his clouds hailstones and coals of fire. Foreigners lost heart and came trembling out of their strongholds. The Lord lives. Blessed be my rock and exalted be the God of my salvation, the God who gave me vengeance and subdued peoples under me, who delivered me from my enemies. Indeed, you exalted me above my adversaries. You delivered me from the violent. For this I will extol you, O Lord, among the nations, and sing praises to your name. Great triumphs he gives to his king, and shows steadfast love to his anointed, to David and his descendants forever. Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing us here today, um, to leading us into this house of worship where we can praise your holy name, where we can celebrate your greatness and give thanks for your grace. Lord God Almighty, we remember that you are a God who is holy and good and perfect and true, but also loving and merciful and kind. You are perfect in every way, and you're worthy of all that we have and all that we are. And so, Lord God, we pray that our worship today would be expressions of our hearts and that you would be celebrated in the ways that are pleasing in your sight. We love you, and we pray these things in the beautiful and holy name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Yeah. 
seem to forget at least one announcement, even when they are up on the media shout. But um, another thing to mention is we're going to have lunch at Patrick and Blondine's after church on uh, today. So looking forward to that. It's always a great time of fellowship. Um, if you have something to bring, a side of dessert or something, that'd be great, but it's not necessary. There's always enough food to eat. And even if there's not, there's a KFC about a block away. You can just pick something up on the way over if you want. So, um, But they have a wonderful ballroom that we like to meet in, and they got chess and foosball and all kinds of fun stuff. So I um, hope you all will be part of that fellowship today. It's a really good time. So thank you again, Patrick, and, and also Blondine for, uh, for hosting. We, we love the fellowship. Um, oh, and then if, uh, the children are free to go to uh, Children's Church now if you'd like to. Um, if you want to stay, you're welcome to do that too, but it's up to you. So. All right, let's, uh, let's go to God in prayer. Hold on a second. Let these kids make their way. Heavenly Father, it is such a privilege and such an honor for us to bow before you as your people, uh, knowing that the king of the universe, uh, the creator of all that is seen and unseen, uh, desires to be in fellowship with us, and um, that you just have a heart for us, Lord, that you love us so much that you would come into the world in the person of Jesus the Christ, and that you would dwell among us and live within us, 
through the work of your Holy Spirit. It's just a, a wonderful and marvelous thing that's beyond our, our full comprehension or understanding, and yet we know it to be true, and, and we're so grateful. So grateful for your love and care, uh, so grateful for your protection, for your grace and forgiveness. Uh, so grateful that you, um, you walk through life with us, Lord, that you celebrate the, the joys and the hope and the happiness that we experience in this world, and you, you share in our sufferings, and you give us strength and comfort and peace and, and hope, even, even during times of our deepest sorrow and, and greatest loss and um, deepest pain. And for that, we are so thankful. And God, we, we're grateful that as your people, we can express our love and care for each other as we lift up our concerns in prayer as well. And God, we're grateful again that the, the Girl Scouts are with us today, and we thank you for you bringing them to be part of our, our church life and help us to partner with them in meaningful ministry to make an impact in our society and a difference in the world for your kingdom. We thank you for uh, Julie and Penelope's heart uh, to encourage and love and and offer um, guidance to the next generation of, of believers and um, the next generation in our society. We thank you, Lord, for the fellowship that we look forward to at Patrick and Blondine's and just grateful for the chance to, to break bread together and to share life together. And we thank you as an extension of receiving Holy Communion today as we um, enjoy a, a meal together as, as brothers and sisters in Christ. And we know you'll be present with us. And for that, we, we thank you. God, we're grateful that um, Shannon's daughter Kaylee's surgery went well this week, and we pray that you give her patience as she has 16 weeks of healing and rehab in front of her. We pray that you give her strength and endurance and perseverance, and that you bring her to a full and complete recovery so she can enjoy basketball and running and activities and just a, a, lively, a lively life in front of her. We pray for Karen that you continue to bring healing to her ankle as she's recovering from surgery. Um, and Lord, we pray for uh, the family and loved ones and friends, those who are grieving over the sudden and unexpected death of, of Tommy King, who uh, young guy just in his 40s passed away this week, and we know that he has, has good friends here in this family of faith, and, and so many people are hurting over his loss. And We pray that, um, that your Holy Spirit would comfort uh, his family, um, his children, uh, those who love him most deeply. We pray that you bless them with strength and hope in the midst of grief and sorrow and just the assurance that you are with them in, in their pain and suffering. We, we thank you, Lord, for uh, the, the promise of eternal life for those who put our faith in Jesus and the assurance that we have that even though our life here on earth is, is, is numbered, our days are numbered, we have innumerable days with you forever in your kingdom of heaven. And so we celebrate that amazing gift you give to your people. Uh, Lord, we lift up to you Ukraine and the conflict, the violence, the war that's been taking place there. And we continue to ask God that you would just create a miracle and turn back the Russian troops, that you turn the heart of Vladimir Putin away from violence and towards peace. We pray, Lord, for President Biden, for our political leaders, for others around the world who are involved with this to give them wisdom and guidance and how to best address the situation to, um, to limit the deaths and, and violence. Um, and we pray, Lord, that in the midst of all this, that your people would step forward to offer love and compassion and, and care for those who are most deeply affected. We, we pray that in the midst of pain, you know, C.S. Lewis said that you, you whisper to us in our pleasure, but you shout to us in our pain. And we pray for those who are hurting and struggling will hear your voice and come to Christ and would know the, the, the saving grace that you offer us through your son. We pray, God, that um, you would help us to be more faithful witnesses to Jesus, that you'd help us to live lives of integrity and help us to um, leave behind our habits and uh, tendencies towards sin and to, to be more like Jesus, our Lord and Savior, and in so doing, be a brighter light that shines in this world. And we pray, God, that, that would, we'd not just leave it at that, but we'd also have the boldness and the courage and the love for others to verbalize our faith in Jesus and invite others to believe in him so that they too might know the joy and peace and hope, uh, the forgiveness of putting their faith in 
our Lord and Savior. God, I thank you for the privilege and honor of reading and sharing your word today, and I pray that you give us attentive hearts. I pray that you, you give us a hunger and a thirst for the truth of your word. I pray that you give us a de desire to learn and grow in our faith as we receive the revelation of scripture today. And I pray, God, that you help us to just have a deeper and richer and fuller life as we seek to follow after him. And I pray, God, as his disciples, that we would recall and, and share uh, the very prayer that he, he taught us to pray today, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Okay, so we are continuing our sermon series today in Genesis, and we're in Genesis 19. As I mentioned last week, uh, last week, this week, and next week, they're all kind of a PG-13 kind of sermons. Uh, so they're tough texts, but when we work uh, methodically through the Bible, we end up facing tough texts and some things that we don't necessarily want to address. Um, this is probably one of those, but um, looking forward to uh, working through this. And um, just pray that God will be at work through his word and through this message. So uh, I'm going to read uh, Genesis chapter 19, verses 14 through 29, and ask you now to listen attentively to the holy word of God. So Lot went out and said to his sons-in-law, who were to marry his daughters, Up, get out of this place, for the Lord is about to destroy the city. But he seemed to his sons-in-laws to be jesting. When morning dawned, the angels urged Lot, saying, Get up, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, or else you will be consumed in the punishment of the city. But he lingered. And so the men seized him and his wife and his two daughters by the hand, the Lord being merciful to him, and they brought him out and left him outside the city. When they had brought them outside, they said, Flee for your life. Do not look back or stop anywhere in the plain. Flee to the hills, or else you'll be consumed. And Lot said to them, Oh no, my lords, your servant has found favor with you, and you have shown me great kindness in saving my life. But I cannot flee to the hills, for fear of the disaster will overtake me and I die. Look, that city is near enough to flee to, and it is a little one. Let me escape there. Is it, is it not a little one? And my life will be saved. He said to him, Very well. I grant you this favor too, and will not overthrow the city of which you have spoken. Hurry, escape there, for I can do nothing until you arrive there. Therefore the city was called Zoar. The sun had risen on the earth when Lot came to Zoar. Then the Lord rained on Sodom and Gomorrah sulfur and fire from the Lord out of heaven. And he overthrew those cities and all the plain and all the inhabitants of the cities and what grew on the ground. But Lot's wife behind him looked back and she became a pillar of salt. Abraham went early in the morning to the place where he had stood before the Lord, and he looked down toward Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all the land of the plain, and he saw the smoke of the land going up like the smoke of a furnace. So it was that when God destroyed the cities of the plain, God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow when he overthrew the cities in which Lot had settled. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So uh, as I was doing a little research for this uh, sermon this week, I dug up this article, and it was in a publication that's called The Spectator. And The Spectator apparently is, a, is an Irish publication. And uh, back in 2015, um, apparently Ireland voted to affirm uh, same-sex marriages. And that shouldn't be too surprising. That's just kind of the direction that the world has been heading for a while now. So I wasn't too surprised to, to see that. But then it also included in the article how many, not everyone obviously, but a lot of religious leaders were also affirming this. And, and the Pope, I guess, was, was affirming this. And some of the local uh, church leader, leaders, the clergy in, in Ireland also said that, you know, that was a good thing. And again, that's unfortunate, but not, not too surprising. That's just the kind of direction things are going. But what I did find surprising was how the, the journalist, the, the writer of the article, uh, responded to the church's approval of, of same-sex marriages. 
Now, the guy's name is Matthew Paris, and he calls himself, he identifies as a gay atheist. And yet he publicly lamented what he called the wishy-washy stance that the church has on, on this issue. And so here, I just want to read a couple little uh, sections of the article. He says, Paris writes, even as a gay atheist, I wince to see the philosophical mess that religious conservatives are making of their case. Is there nobody of any intellectual stature left in the church to frame the argument against Christianity's slide into just going with the flow of social and cultural change? Can't these Christians see that the moral basis of their faith cannot be sought in the pollster's arithmetic? And so he's, he's saying the moral basis of our faith is not based on the popular vote on what people in the world say is good or bad or right or wrong. It's supposed to be based on, on scripture, right? And then he says, it must surely be implicit in the claim of any of the world's great religions that in questions of morality, a majority may be wrong. But this should be vividly evident to Christians in particular. They need only consider the fate of their Messiah and the persecution of adherence to the early church. And then he quotes scripture. He says, blessed are you when men revile you and persecute you. In other words, expect, we should expect opposition from the world when we um, are advocates for what scripture teaches. And then he concludes, maybe I'm the fool, the one who's missing something. Have some of us made the mistake of taking the church at its word? Or was it always about going with the flow? Was it always secretly about imposing the morals of the majority on the minority? So, that, so all that is necessary is to discover which way the preponderance falls. So he says, is the church really just about being blown around by the wind, just going the way society goes? Is that, all, is that what the church is really about? And so here's this guy who professes to be a, an atheist. He identifies as gay, and he has no problem with the church standing up for what the church is supposed to believe in, what the, what the scriptures teach. He, he expects the church to do that, right? But after the church responded to this popular vote by affirming same-sex same marriage, he concludes that all the church is really concerned about is just appeasing the public, just going along with with what the culture does and says. And so when the church in Ireland affirmed gay marriage, it lost credibility as a witness to God in the eyes of Matthew Paris. And now, as an atheist, he has little reason to believe in the God the church claims to believe in. And as a gay man, he has little reason to take seriously the, the claims in scripture that homosexuality is a sin. And as a sinner, as all of us are, he has little reason to take seriously the claim that he needs to repent and trust in God's grace in order to escape the wrath to come. After all, if those who are called to bear witness to God don't really believe in God's word, then why should he, right? Well, something similar is happening in, in this text today. As the church in Ireland want people like Matthew Paris to believe God's word and to put their trust in God, Lot wants his sons-in-law to believe in God's word and to trust in God. But the text tells us that when he urged them to flee God's wrath, he seemed to the sons-in-law to be jesting. He passionately and urgently tells them to leave the city, and to them it just, it just seems like a joke. Like the church today, Lot lost his credibility as a witness because he was so agreeable to sin. I mean, he's been dwelling, he's been living, he, he bought a house in Sodom, he's been living in the middle of Sin City for, for years, and over all this time, he's never objected to all the lust and the violence and the rebellion until now. He's always just kind of gone with the flow, he's always just, just, just kind of accepted it. And now that he tries to warn his sons-in-law, he, he shouldn't be surprised by the response. You can imagine what they're thinking. They're, they're like, if this city is so wicked, then how come you've been living here all this time, right? How come you've been dwelling here for so long if it's so bad? And, and, and if God's so angry and if his, his judgment is real, if he's going to destroy the city, why, why would you settle down here? And, and why would you want your daughters to marry people like us? You know, there's a phrase, I'm sure you've heard it before, it's pretty common, that Christians are called to be in the world, but not of the world, right? You've heard that before, right? Um, to be in the world means that we are called to 
build relationships with people in society. We're to love people. We're to love our neighbor as ourself. To, to be in the world means we're to be a positive influence in the world we live in. We're not called to be hermits to isolate ourselves and avoid uh, this world. We're called to be a part of it. We're called to be salt and light in the culture in which we live, right? And on the other hand, not being of the world means that we're to live differently than non-believers do, right? We're, we're to be as faithful as we can to the teachings of Scripture, and we must try to preserve the morals and the practices in our society that are consistent with God's Word, and, and when society moves away from it or rebels against it, we're, we're to, to try to be an influence, to, to lead our culture back into or towards more a biblically, biblically sound uh, way of living and, and thinking. And to the extent that we fail to be in the world, we lose our ability to influence the culture we're a part of. And to the extent that we are of the world, we lose our credibility as witnesses of God's wrath and of his saving grace, of his, of his mercy. Well, Lot, Lot allowed himself, he, he was pretty good at being in the world, right? I mean, he lived in Sodom, but he, he allowed himself to lose sight of his calling of not being of the world. Right, and, and as a consequence, no matter how desperately he tried to warn his future sons-in-law of God's wrath, they, they just thought he was jesting. They just didn't take it seriously. They, they thought it was a joke. And as a result, they, they perish. And so when the church, when we dwell in sin, when we are agreeable to, to sin, um, we start to reflect the values of society rather than standing strong on the word of God. And as a consequence, we lose credibility with people like Matthew Paris. And it's not just about homosexuality. I mean, how agreeable has the church become to heterosexual people who are cohabitating? We, we're, we're fine with that. It's no big deal, you know? And so there's, it can, I can make a list of dozens of things. We just, we just kind of say it's okay, no big deal, don't worry about it. And... Um, we want to be loving, we want to be kind, but really the most loving thing we can do is call people to truth, call people to live in ways that more closely line up with God's expressed will, right? Now, so as a result of the wishy-washiness of the church, as Matthew Paris says, he's, he's unlikely to repent. He's unlikely to um, trust in God's grace. He's unlikely to escape God's wrath. Now, the text shows us there's another danger to dwelling in sin. And the, the longer we dwell in sin, the longer that we're agreeable to it, um, the more difficult it is for us to leave our sinful ways behind. You know, the more we surround ourselves with sin, we agree with, with it, we cons cons um, what, assent to it or resign ourselves to it, the harder it is to, for us to live a life that's pleasing to God. You know, Lot dwelt in sin for a long time. He built his house in Sin City, and we notice what happened, notice what happened to him as a result. Uh, they, the, the text says that the angels tell him, get up, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, or else you'll be consumed in the punishment of the city. But he lingered, the text says. Lot knew the angels of God came to him to warn him that God's wrath is coming. And he believed it so much that he even went to his sons-in-law to try to get them out of the city. And yet he lingered. Think about how ridiculous that is. Fire and brimstone is going to fall from the sky. And yet he lingered. Sin had got a hold of him. He, he dwelt in this city for so long. He'd been surrounded by it that... It, it took hold of his life. And even though he knew what was God's will, even though he knew that God's wrath was, was coming, he just couldn't quite get himself to go. And, and that shows us that, that trusting in God is more than just a mental or intellectual decision that we make. We have emotional and spiritual things going on within us. We have, an, we have internal conflict. We're at war with ourselves, wanting to do what is right, and yet finding ourselves pulled to do what is wrong. And it's a constant battle we face. If you read Romans chapter 7, the Apostle Paul does a marvelous job of expressing the struggle that he has in his life. We're talking about Paul, the great Saint Paul, this wonderful follower of Christ, this, this, the most effective evangelist in the history of the church. 
and he had the struggle. So we can expect we're going to have it, right? It, look at, listen to what he says in Romans 7, 15 through 17. I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree that the law is good, but in fact, it's no longer I that do it, but sin that dwells within me. And so we're in the midst of this internal spiritual battle. And as children of God, we want to do what is right. In our minds, we know this is what pleases God. This is what I ought to do. But there's this powerful force at work within us that wants to get a hold of us and wants to lead us into ways of, of passion and degradation and rebellion against God. And, and, and the longer we live in sin and the more often we, we reside in the presence of sin and pres sinful influence, that the harder it is for us to do what our mind tells us to do and the more easily we fall into the ways of the flesh, the ways of sin and rebellion. The longer we're in the habit of losing control of our anger, the more difficult it is for us to be at peace. The longer we're in the habit of lust or looking at pornography, the more difficult it is to stop. The, the longer we stew in envy or jealousy, the harder it is for us to let it go. And it's true of any sin you want to name. I mean, uh, the longer we do, dwell in, in self-pity or greed or racism or laziness or addictions or, or pride or, or self-righteousness, the more difficult it is to be, to be set free from, from it. And for a lot, sin has taken such a strong hold on him, he doesn't, he doesn't want to leave Sodom. God's going to rain fire upon the city, and he still doesn't want to go. It's like al alcoholics, that, you know, an alcoholic knows that alcohol is bad for them. They, they know, many of them know, if they keep drinking, they're going to die. And yet, too often they find themselves lingering around the bar, <laughs> lingering around the liquor cabinet. They know in their minds it's deadly and dangerous, but it's got a, it's got a hold of them. For many of them, it's, it's, it's just really difficult to be set free. It is not wise to dwell in sin. And that's why Jesus teaches us in the Lord's Prayer. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Right? Jesus knows the, the less we allow ourselves to be tempted, the easier it is for us then to begin to live the life that, that he would have us to live. And, Another thing that Lot does in this text is he, he tries to compromise with God. He actually kind of succeeds in compromising with God. The angel of the Lord tells him to flee to the hills, but he's too afraid. And he says, oh no, my lords, your servant has found favor with you, and you have shown me great kindness in saving my life, but I cannot flee to the hills for fear of the disaster that will overtake me and, and I'll die. He, he's scared to, to fully do God's will, and God allows him in his foolishness and succumbing to his fear to only go partway. To only get partway out of, of Sodom. He gets out of Sodom, but partway out of the realm that God is going to bring his judgment upon. And we're going to see next, in next week's text how this leads to a chain of events that creates just disaster in his life. It's just heartbreaking what happens. So we'll talk about that. Come back next, year, next week for the exciting conclusion, right? Um, but Lot does not fully trust in the Lord. And, and as, as a result... He faces, faces tragedy. So reluctantly, Lot leaves Sodom with his wife and his daughters, and then we see yet again another danger of dwelling in sin. The angels tell Lot and his family, flee for your life and do not look back. So what does Lot's wife do? What does she do? She, <laughs> yeah, she looks back. She, she does the one thing she's not supposed to do back. She, she looks back. She, she's fleeing from God's wrath. She's entering into the realm of God's grace. Her life has been saved. She's been warned. Don't look back. And she finds herself wanting to see what's going on back there. She is longing for the life that she once had. She, 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 like Lot, she dwelt in Sodom. She, she lived in this realm of sin for so long that even though she knew it was wrong, she knew it was bad, it felt like home. It was comfortable for her. It was what she was, was drawn to. And so she looks back. And what happens to her? <laughs> she turns into a pillar of salt. Isn't that, isn't that bizarre? 
Um, I have no idea why God turned it into a pillar of salt. I've, I've heard critical scholars say, well, you know, this is down by the Dead Sea, and there's salt everywhere, and there's piles of salt, salt, salty rocks, and it's just kind of a myth that says, oh, this is why there's so much salt. God turned all these people into salt. I, I don't know why God turned her into salt, but obviously the result of her longing to go back resulted in her death. And even though she avoided the, the fire and brimstone, she still ended up suffering death. The wages of sin is death. She ended up suffering God's wrath. And so I don't know why God turned her into salt, but I know that I don't want that to happen to me. And so in a spiritual sense, we're tempted to do the same thing that Lot's wife did. We, we leave behind that old way of life, that, that, that sinful realm, and we find ourselves kind of looking back. We kind of long for it sometimes. We leave behind the alcoholism or the, the drug abuse or the, the, the anger or the, the lust or the wildlife, the promiscuity or, or the jealousy or the self-righteousness or whatever it is, whatever sin that particularly had hold of us. And we just have, even though it's against our, our thought process, against we know what is right, we have this inclination to want to go back to what was comfortable for us, what in some ways, in some ways we enjoyed. And um, part of us longs to go back to the old way of life. We want to indulge in the ways of the flesh. And I, I wish I would have thought of it earlier in the week. Um, it would have been great for our worship team to have led us in the song that I've, I've decided to follow Jesus. That would have been a good one today. Um, you, know the, the, you know how the song goes. The so fourth stanza says, The world behind me, the cross before me. The world behind me, the cross before me. The world behind me, the cross before me. No turning back. No turning back. And that's the resolve that we have to have when we long to go back to that old way of life. We need to be determined to continue to live for Jesus. And you know, I've been asked before, well, what do you think about, like, can Christians backslide? What do you think about once saved, always saved? Is it possible to lose your salvation? And I don't, I don't know how to answer that question. I mean, there, there's, I, one of my favorite texts in Scripture is from John 10, where Jesus says, no one can snatch you out of the Father's hand. And so we have this amazing assurance that we're in God's care. He protects us. He's almighty. No one's stronger than he is. We're safe, safe in his care. So we have that assurance of our salvation. On the other hand, there are texts in Scripture that warn us, that warn people who are followers of Jesus of the dangers of the devil and, and even of potential for death. Um, we got to take those seriously, too. You know, Jesus warned Peter, Satan tried to sift you as wheat. He, he, tells, his, he tells his followers to, to stay alert, um, be, be in prayer. And, and the most striking text to me is in 1 Peter 5, where um, Peter's writing to the church. He's writing to followers of Christ, and he says, be, aw be aware. Satan is like a, a lion prowling around looking for someone to devour. That sounds like death to me. <laughs> that sounds like believers in Christ are, are in real danger of, of, of facing death. And the longer we dwell in sin, the more inclined we might be to turn back. So we, we can't turn back. So in spite of all Lot's weaknesses, his moral failures, he flees from Sodom and God saves him. God saves him from his, from his wrath. But Lot's wife ended up perishing because she turned back. Now, some people might ask why God must bring down his wrath upon anyone. And I kind of talked about this last week in just a minute. And the short answer is because God is holy. You know, God is holy. And um, it's not that God wants to destroy the wicked. He doesn't take any pleasure in, in the death of the wicked. He wants people to be saved. That's why he sent his son. He loves us so much. He sent his son for us. He wants more than we do that we would be saved. Um, but I really believe in situations like Sodom, he, he knows the people of Sodom are not going to repent from their sins. He knows the human heart. They're not going to repent anyway. And so by exercising his wrath in the, in the physical realm, in the world where we can see it, fire and brimstone falls down from heaven, and we get this incredible picture of what hell is like, what God's judgment is like. And for the rest of us, for all of the humanity after the, the city of Lot, this is an act of mercy because we're alerted to the reality of God's wrath. And the truth that he wants to save us. And so he calls us to flee from wrath and, and to, to seek out his grace and to know his love and forgiveness. I mean, 
the better question to ask, rather than how could God destroy the wicked, is, is how could God be so loving and merciful that he would save someone like us? I mean, how could God save someone like Lot, who deliberately left the promised land to dwell in Sin City? How could he still choose to save him when he lingered in the city after he was warned about God's wrath? How could God save someone who cried and whined because he had to walk up the hill in order to be saved? I mean, come on. How could he save someone who, after being saved from Sin City, wants to move to another city that's full of sin? Well, the text tells us God saved Lot because he remembered Abraham. The text says God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow when he overthrew the cities in which Lot had settled. God saves Lot for the sake of the covenant that God made with Abraham, right? Go back to Genesis 12. God promised Abraham, I'll bless you, and through you I'll bless all the nations of the earth. I'll bless those who bless you. And, I'll... and, and Lot, by virtue of being Abraham's nephew, of being part of his family, is included in this covenant. And because God remembered Abraham, he saved Lot. And so now we have to ask, why would God be willing to save us? Why would God be willing to save someone like me? When we make an honest assessment of our lives, we realize that we are a lot like Lot, right? We've compromised our ability to witness effectively because we dwell in sin. We've been warned of the dangers of God's wrath, and yet we linger. When we flee sin, we're tempted to look back. We want that old way of life. Part of us wants to continue to indulge in our sinful desires, and too often we leave behind sin only to enter into it all over again. And yet God saves us because he's merciful. The covenant that God made with Abraham only anticipates a greater and more wonderful and more enduring covenant that he's made through his son. God saves us sinners because he remembers the righteousness of Jesus. We're saved by virtue of being part of this covenant as members of his family. I mentioned how Paul struggled with his tendency to sin in Romans 7. And at, at the end of the chapter, it's just wonderful. He's so frustrated with himself. He says, wretched man that I am, who will rescue me from this body of death? And then he answers his own question. He says, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And like Paul, there will be times when we're frustrated by our tendency to sin. And we'll, but we, almost, we always must seek to repent and be more obedient. But like Paul, we take comfort in knowing that God's grace wins out in our hearts that God has remembered Jesus and he saves us because he honors the covenant that he made with his son. And all we can do then is join Paul in saying, thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our offering text is from the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 20, Paul says, And now I commend you to God and to the message of his grace, a message that is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all who are sanctified. I coveted no one's silver or gold or clothing. You know for yourselves I work with my own hands to support myself and my companions. In all this I have given you an example that by such work we must support the weak, remembering the words of the Lord Jesus. For he himself said, It is more blessed to give than to receive. May we celebrate that truth that it is truly more blessed to give than it is to receive as we give of our tithes and offerings today.
respond to your invitation His body, His blood, the death He has overcome, every trial we face. None too lost to be saved, none too broken or ashamed, all are welcome in the name. By Your mercy we come to Your table, by Your grace You Worship leads to communion. We respond to your invitation. We remember you. Dying, you destroyed our death. Rising, you restored our life. Lord Jesus, come in glory. Jesus, come in glory. Lord Jesus, come in glory. Lord Jesus, come in glory. Lord, we remember you. And remembrance leads us to worship. And as we Worship leads to communion. We respond to your invitation. We respond to your invitation. We remember you. a wonderful segue into um, receiving the sacrament of Holy Communion today. Um, before we do receive the sacrament, I would like to ask you all to join me in this confession of sin to prepare our hearts for receiving this uh, symbol and assurance of God's beautiful grace. Heavenly Father, we confess that too often we allow sin to take hold of our hearts. Like Lot, we linger in our sin rather than urgently fleeing from its danger. Like Lot's wife, we sometimes look back with longing for our former way of life. Help us to leave our sinful ways quickly and decisively. We trust that living in your will is always best for us. We thank you for calling us to take refuge in the mercy of our Savior. Amen. So it's our practice here at Cornerstone Church that on the first Sunday of the month that we celebrate uh, Holy Communion, the Lord's Supper, and for anyone who professes faith in Jesus Christ, you're welcome to this table. Um, this table is not for those who are perfect or who think we are, but those who are broken and sinful and are looking for the assurance and comfort that God's grace is enough for us and that he offers it to us through the gift of his son, our Savior, Jesus the Christ. Um, please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful sacrament. We thank you, God, that you remembered your son, Jesus the Christ, and offers us salvation. And as we remember what Jesus has done for us through this act of receiving this bread and this, this cup, may you use it to strengthen us in our faith and assure us of your love and, and fortify us in your grace. We receive this gift with humility, with gratitude, and thanks in our hearts. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Listen now to the words of institution. The Lord Jesus, on the night of his arrest, took bread, 
And after giving thanks to God, he broke it. He gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink of it, do so in remembrance of me. For every time we eat of this bread and drink of this cup, we proclaim the saving death of the risen Lord until he comes. So our practice here is for you all to come down the middle aisle, and I will dip the bread and hand it to you to kind of minimize touching, and then you take, receive it and go ra back around to your seat. Uh, but the meal is prepared, and I ask you now all to come forward.
Please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this holy sacrament that you've given us. And we thank you, Lord, that even as food and drink give us physical strength, you have given us this meal to strengthen us spiritually, to assure us of your grace, to confirm in our hearts that your mercy is enough for us in spite of all the ways we behave like Lot and rebel against you. Help us, God, in the the renewing of your Holy Spirit to live as the new creations you call us to be, living, leaving behind the old way of life and moving forward and following after Jesus and living for his glory. Help us to go out in the world to bear witness, faithful witness to the goodness and mercy of your son, our Savior, Jesus the Christ. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Please stand now for the blessing. And don't forget, uh, you're all welcome to join us for lunch over at Patrick and Blondine's house. Uh, it's always a wonderful time of fellowship. We hope to see you there. But as we go out in the world, uh, let us remember we are called to be in the world, but not of the world. And to the extent that we do that by the power of the Holy Spirit, we can bear witness to our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ, who has had mercy on us, who has saved us from God's wrath and brought us into his grace. And we can invite other people uh, to receive that blessing as well and be, be part of God's kingdom. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Amen. Amen.